Hey guys, welcome back to Houdini Houdono. This is a 10-part mini tutorial series that covers simulation techniques and we've covered the broad base of simulation techniques across the past 7 episodes. So this is episode 8. So in this episode, I'm going to show you how to combine some of these techniques to achieve what you see on screen now. What you see on screen now should be some water simulation that's going through a pipe. However, this is not a flip simulation. This is just a particle simulation. This is a workaround to achieve something fairly light to achieve this look of a water simulation. And this effect can be very useful for beauty commercials when you want to show some water flowing through a pipe or some of the other rendering concepts in this tutorial can also apply to uh, this kind of beauty commercials which I'll get into later. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Just before we jump into Houdini, let me briefly explain what we're going to do here. Essentially, we're going to create a pipe system that runs from the top of the screen and then it does something like this and it goes across the floor and runs across like this, right? So to achieve in Houdini, we can um, basically model a line like this and then we will use this line and every line has uh, this idea of the flow along the line. We will use this little concept of the flow to drive a particle simulation and so what we do is we will have here a source of particles and it runs uh, down through the pipe like this. Okay. Next, we will make a little mock geometry of um, a water bubble so all we gotta do is to create a sphere that has some polygons on it and then we'll drop down mountain salt let me draw a couple of mountains here and then it will deform the water like this and we're going to copy this uh, mock geometry on all the, all the particles that we have simulated and vary its size so that we have this mountain here, mountain here, mountain here and also we are going to um, mesh this stuff together uh, using the BDB surface and this technique doesn't account for the penetrations that might happen outside the pipe so we will generate the pipe geometry and also turn that pipe geometry into a VDB VDB surface and then I can take we're gonna take this two and do a subtraction so that anything that's outside of the surface of the tube gets uh, erased Right. We'll just use a minus operation to remove whatever is outside. That leaves us with uh, the nice bubbly action that we are going to get within the tubes. Of course, we will also need to uh, use this pipe as a VDB collision. So we will use uh, also the same surface, I believe, um, to uh, make sure that the, the particles don't get outside of the tube. Right. Technically, for technically we don't have to do this. And you might be wondering why. Since we are going to minus it out using the VDBs anyway, why would we be concerned about this? Right? Uh, this, is, this is to get a more believable motion of the particles. So for instance, let me just mark the particles red. If we were to uh, simulate the, the particles like this, uh, if they hit against the wall and they come back and they just generally obey the collisions of the tube, it will make for a more convincing um, effect. So hopefully this makes sense. So let me just list down uh, as always uh, what we are going to do in this video. So one is to create a line uh, which then creates the tube. Two is to create a particle simulation. Particle, particle, can spell particle simulation. Simulation that runs along a curve. And there's a note for this. It's called the pop curve force. Curve force. And finally, uh, we're going to use the concept of VDBs. VDBs combined and finally we are going to discuss some of the tips and tricks and things to look out for when when, when rendering liquids right so I'll be using Redshift for this um, tutorial so Redshift rendering of liquids okay so one two three and four uh, let me just arrange this nicely so to recap, we have uh, step one, which is to draw a line, which we have over here. Step one, draw this line, um, which then part of 1B is to create a tube, which is over here, to create this tube. And then step two, now mark it in green, is to run the particle simulation, or in, rather in red, because I've already used red for what I was talking about just now. The particle sim will run through here. And using the pop curve force node, so this is uh, the curve force that I was drawing along here. And then we will use the VDB combine, which I will use green uh, over here to convert stuff into the surfaces and then run this uh, little mock geometry here. I guess I'm missing one step here, <laughs> but, but I think you guys can follow along, uh, which is to create the copy the mock geometry of our water bubble onto the particles. 
and finally to con um, to talk a little bit about rendering the liquids in Redshift and in Houdini. Okay, so I believe that's enough talking and we can get straight into Houdini itself. All right, so uh, here right in Houdini, we will drop down a geometry node as always and change this node to setup where I'll do all my setup and hide it. Then I'll dive inside and create a font sop. So I was thinking about it and I think the letter H is uh, very helpful for our case. And then we'll drop down a match size node, match size and drop uh, down to the minimum Y to let it sit on the floor like this. And I'll drop down a carve node um, to remove parts of the curve that I do not want. So maybe like this. And then I'll use my custom selection tool, apply a transform, use my magnet snapping and snap it to this point here and also then move it down to somewhere over here, maybe. Okay, so this is how I get uh, some pipes. And just for a good measure, I'm just gonna select this point too and select the transform node and just move it globally upwards like this. Then I'm gonna drop down a resample node to resample all the points evenly. And the first time I'm gonna resample by the polygon edge so that uh, it respects uh, the current shape. And then run it once more um, by changing and this time I'm just gonna choose subdivision curves so that we can get a slight rounding over here, right? I think um, this little spacing here might be a little bit too tight. So I'm just going to adjust the curve again. Over here, I'm going to select these two points. Press down, uh, drop down a transform node and move this to the side like this. Then after all that, I'm just going to drop down a match size node so that I center this whole curve to, um, to, the, to the center of this world. I put down a minimum Y and so that's it. That's my curve. And then I'm going to drop uh, down a poly wire. Poly wire node. This is to make our tube. In this case, I can change the divisions to 8 and just uh, size the wire radius down to 0.05. And here you can see that uh, it's sitting on the floor like this, like this. However, you notice that um, we want the tube to also be sitting on the floor, right? So I will drop down another match size node here to make sure that the tube sits on the floor like, like this. And this transformation that is done to the eventual geometry here, um, we will store this transformation, this last move up into the X form attribute here. And then I will do an attribute copy to copy this X form attribute over. Like I can choose from this drop down menu, X form, remove the CD. It copies the X form attribute uh, from this little move up from here to here. And then now I can do a transform by attribute and choose to transform. The default is there to choose to transform by the X form. So now it's dynamic, right? If I to size the wire radius up, and the match size calculates how much higher it needs to move to make it sit on the floor. That transformation is also applied to then this curve over here. I hope that makes sense. And now I'm going to size it back down to 0.05 and drop down a couple of nulls. So one null here is to say that this is our out tube. And then another null here to say that this is our curve and then I will color. This is just a reference curve. I will not render it. So I'm just going to put ref. This is something I will actually render. So I will make it green and the ref I'll mark it as blue. Okay. So let's refer back to our notes. Uh, we see here that uh, we are done with step one and we have the line and then we also have the tube. Next, we'll run our particle simulation with uh, the pop curve force. So let's get back to Houdini. Hope you guys are following along. Okay. So to really sum of the particles, we need an emission source as always. Um, right, right before I run the simulation, I'm going just going to change my simulation timeline here to 100 frames so that I don't run too many frames. And then, so at the start of this curve, I'm going to copy a little circle onto it. So I'll just make a circle, copy to points, and copy only to the starting frame. So now it's copying to every point. So I just need um, to group up what is the first point and what is the last point. So on this resample here, I can check this thing called curve view attribute. So on the copy the points here, I can say that the target point, it's uh, only when the curve view attribute is equal to zero, equal equal zero. There are two equal signs here to denote that this is a condition. And if this condition is met, when the curve view attribute is zero, uh, that's the point that we want to copy our little circle onto. So let's do that. And so our circle is copied onto that point. And this circle, I'm going to orient it to the YZ plane and also scale it down 
to 0 0.05 as per the thickness of our tube here and change it to a polygon. So now on this circle is where we can do our pop net. So let's drop down a pop net to run our particle simulation and we can run the playback on this so you can see a bunch of particles. Now everything is a little bit too small and when I press the spacebar F and try to focus on the points I don't see it so I'm going to press D and go down to the view options and our near click plane I'm just going to drop down 0.1 or 0.05 and I can see the particles and so this happens uh, once in a while so just take note on how to fix that so you can see the particles are formed except that they don't follow along this curve so we got to reference this curve now. So if I dive into the pop net over here, I can drop down this node as uh, denoted in our notes over here. There's this node inside the pop net that we can use called pop curve force. So let's switch over to Houdini and inside the dot net, inside this pop net, type down pop curve force and look at that. We have this node that we can use and here it asks for which is our geometry source uh, for our curve. And in this case, we can pick uh, this menu here and choose reference curve which we prepared earlier and we can see that it, it gives this very um, large uh, representation of the curve and this actually is uh, will, this actually will affect our simulation so we gotta decrease our max influence uh, down to something that looks like the curve and I do know that it's uh, 0 0.05 so let's uh, do that and you can see that the curve has been resampled into a very low sample here and it's also smoothed that's because under the shaping tab here um, the default resampling is turned on so let's turn that off and well the display is like this not because of that it's actually because in the guides tab here so there are a lot of checkboxes to look out for um, the guide spacing here uh, it's like a viewport resampling so I just need to bring this down to also 0.05 so this is a good representation of what our guide curve actually looks like and so I'll run the simulation now and let's see what happens but uh, before I do that I need to turn off the guide geometry and let's just run this simulation here. So you can see that everything just spreads out like this. Everything is too strong, right? So over here on the individual forces, um, these are the defaults where over the length of the curve here, the follow along curve energy gets tapered away. So we don't want any tapering along the length of the curve, uh, regardless if it's the follow, the suction or the orbit. So let's just take the second or the first um, little handle here and just throw it off the graph so that's removed and so we everything is uh, on its full right so let's run the simulation again and see what happens so it gets even worse right that's because they are generally too strong right at a factor of one which is a uh, one velocity it actually jumps a whole unit of one here you can see on my grid now some of us might think that these are arbitrary values to an extent they are but to give an inkling usually or what i start with is to assume that this would be a world unit so you can see on my world grid now this is zero and this is one so in one time step it attempts to jump one whole unit like this so this is extremely fast and in the next simulation frame it jumps one whole unit again right so this is very very fast i'm just going to drop everything down to 0 0.05 and then see what this does so you can see it's uh, a lot more sound here and then I'm going to check real-time toggle here where my mouse is circling. Okay, so it's a little bit better but it's still not following my curve. So let's uh, see what's going on. Uh, there's still one more force along curve here that I need to turn off. So after some noodling around, um, I realized that uh, it might help if um, the tube influence radius here is uh, a little bit more than 0 0.05 so just slightly bigger might help uh, to catch uh, all the all the particles might that might go slightly out of the tube and we can try to bring them back right so uh, just earlier i mentioned that i'm bringing back all down to 0 0.01 and this orb orbital scale is uh, causing the particles to move outwards a little bit too much so i'm just going to turn it off and you can see what happens right it's going straight down now and on the inherent velocity skills, I, I don't have uh, inherent velocity, so I'm just going to also turn that off. So right now it's a balance uh, of the follow skill and the suction skill. So the follow skill pushes the particles along the path, and the suction skill keeps it to the path to avoid getting out of control and escaping the captivity of <laughs> the, the bounds of uh, uh, this uh, curve force here. However, if I increase my suction skill like this 2.5, you will notice that it kind of helps but it also doesn't help. So if I increase this to 10, uh, it also doesn't help, right? So right now I'm in a catch where uh, I can't get the balance of this to work. So I gotta add a little bit more air resistance here. 
So here in the air resistance, I'm just going to increase it to 10. And you can see that helped a little bit if I increase it to 100. So you can see it moves along the path more. So right now I'm just going to lower my force scale down to 0 0.05. And also my suction scale down to 0 0.05. You can see it kind of follows the path a little bit more. 0 0.03. So I adjusted the air resistance now to 200 and it seems to fall along, along the path uh, quite a bit more. And then I'm just going to adjust my suction scale to 0 0.05. See everything follows along now. Um, but you can see my, when my suction scale is too strong, it actually causes it to be a little bit too conservative and st stuck to the line. So maybe I can introduce a little bit of an orbit scale. Yeah. So uh, I have to be very careful with this amount and maybe reduce the suction scale a little bit. The numbers are getting really sensitive now. Okay, finally, I do want to decrease the number of points. So I'm just gonna change this to 200 or 100. And you can see the points flow along. I'm just gonna increase now my follow scale. So that goes a little bit faster. Oh, but then you can see that it escapes the little curve force uh, influence radius here. So I'm just going to increase one more time the air resistance to 300 to see how that helps. So that definitely helps quite a bit. Just going to increase my influence scale. Hopefully it doesn't escape the influence radius, the orbit scale. So it's okay to have uh, one or two particles uh, that leaves the, the, the tube because what we're going to also do is to introduce a collision, right? So here, let me turn off this uh, guide geometry and introduce the collisions here. So to introduce a collision into the pop net, uh, drop down a static object and we can merge uh, these two together from left to right. Uh, that's because the default setting of the merge is set for the left input to affect the right input. Over here on the static object, we are going to put our sort path to our object. So let's uh, jump outside and we can see here that we have this um, tube curve as our object uh, for collision. So now we are on our particle simulation. We do need to get our collisions in. So this tube is our collision. So let's drop down a VDB from polygons. And here we have converted our tube into a collision tube however the representation is poor so let's drop down to the 0.01 and then let's just put a reference note here to call this vdb a reference tube vdb so let's jump into our pop net here and we can on the static object we can select our pop uh, our sort path here Right, our sub path here, we can choose the out tube uh, as a um, viewport representation. But importantly, let's get into the collisions tab here. Under collision detection, let's choose use volume collisions because we are going to use the VDBs. Choose collision guide and choose volume sample. And under the proxy volume source for the uh, tube VDB here. So what happens is if we go to the first frame, we can see now if we do not display the geometry and this is the blue guides of our collision object so let's uh, uncheck the collision guide display and see what this does to our simulation what we are doing now is to make this a collision object and the particles are having a hard time staying within this collision object so what we instead need to do is to do some level of modeling here to uh, extrude this uh, tube uh, to make sure that uh, the walls of the, the, the tube is what we don't want the objects in, right? Uh, so in order to get our collisions working, we got to make a thicker version of this and minus this existing correct version of this, right? So what we do is to create another VDB from polygons. In fact, I'm going to make another poly wire here and just going to make this one twice thicker and also I'm just going to make sure I do the same transformations from my attribute copy so that they move up the same amount as the one that this has moved up, right? And I can use a VDB from Polygon here and another VDB from Polygon here. So they are two different VDBs that I can attempt to do a minus operation. So I'm going to use a VDB combine and connect these two together. So the operation to do is to choose a difference. So A minus B, so I'm going to swap it around by pressing shift R. So it swaps it around and then we can see that there's a thickness over here. Uh, it's a little bit jaggy along the edges over here. So perhaps 
it's a good idea to subdivide the tube uh, twice and also subdivide this one too. So with all that minus, I get uh, some thickness onto my, my geometry here. So for both, I will give it a voxel size of 0 0.005, 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.025, and this seems to give me enough resolution. So let's just uh, run this simulation again. Okay, there is now an issue with um, the ends over here. So I think all I need to do is to make sure that the thicker version of the tube is uh, slightly trimmed on both sides. So I'm just going to drop down a carve node and check both the U and the V and set this to 0.01 and 0.99 so that this curve is shorter than this curve here so that my thicker version of the tube is shorter than the thinner version of the tube. So when I do a minus operation, it gives a clean hole over here. Right, so let's run the simulation again. So it, now it pipes in nicely. You can see that over time, uh, this gets tapered off like this. So with the collision in, we can go back in to adjust our pop curve force by dropping the suction scale um, by half and see if that helps um, this final tapering effect. Or increase the orbit scale to 0.02. And you can see now that uh, it's very nicely flowing along the path like this with the additional orbit effect. Okay. So now is to design. Uh, let's uh, hop back to our notes here and we are on step uh, three. Um, this VDB combine was to one, serve as the collision. And the next thing we got to do is to model the bubbles, right? So let's uh, jump outside to do that. So we have our particle simulation here. We can catch this if you wanted to. However, you can see that if I select this pop net now, it shows all the geometries over here, um, this uh, VDB geometry here, because by default it will show you the static geometry. So in order to circum that, I'm just going to copy this pop object here, the name of this pop object, and paste it here, so that it says that pop net please output only the pop object. Right. So these are particles here, and then we want a sphere as our source single bubble. Choose a polygon here, and copy the points to our pop net here. And this uh, sphere size is at the moment too big. So instead of sizing down the sphere here, I'm just going to use the p-scale attribute from the pop net. So I'm just going to drop down a attribute randomize here. And it's going to randomize uh, one is the color uh, that's by default. So we're going to change the default color to p-scale. So we randomize the p-scale instead. And the p-scale attribute is a one dimension attribute. And we're going to vary it from 0. 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 and we can see now this is the size of our bubbles maybe 0 0.005 to 0 0.02 maybe this is more convincing and these particles are not looking very fluidy now so as mentioned earlier over here we have a sphere as our source sample now we'll drop down mountain salt to make sure that we get some fluid motion on a single sphere like this so drop down a mountain salt mountain and on the mountain sop, it doesn't animate by default. So on the offset or the time node over here, I can type in an expression $FF and it runs at this speed. So if I $FF multiply by 0 0.1, it goes 10 times slower. And this could be the look that we want. However, I think the sphere's resolution is a bit too low. So let's give it maybe 6 frequency. And this is the motion that we have. So you can see now that there's one trouble here that they are mostly oriented the same way. Don't know if you can tell. Let's drop down an attribute randomize and randomize the orient attribute. Orient. It's a four dimension attribute. It will range it from minus one to one. So before and after. You can see that there's a general angular 45 degree angle that all these stems are pointing. So when I randomize the orient attribute, they all feel a little bit more randomized. And just for uh, visualization sake, I will drop down one last attribute randomized and leave it as the default uh, for different colors, which uh, you can of course use for shading. But in our case, um, we just want to see some colors, right? Okay. So once that is done, let's just check that the mountain animation uh, feels actually bubbly. So this is actually okay, but I think we can play around with um, a larger element size and a stronger height so that it's more irregular, the bubbles actually grows and shrinks. Okay, so that when we copy onto it, uh, it feels a little bit more organic. I think the size variance can be a little bit more than this. So just going to change this to 0.05. So it's a tenth of um, the other one. 
Oh, that's a bit too much. Two five. Yeah, like this. Okay. Finally, we can drop down a VDB from polygons. VDB from polygons, and they will all be meshed together as kind of like one object. So I have to uh, drop the voxel size down to a point oh one. 0 0.005, 0 0.0025, or uh, maybe this is um, a little bit too too high resolution. Maybe 0 0.003 is good. Yeah, something like this. And of course, I can use the VDB modeling operations such as VDB smooth SDF to kind of like smooth out some of um, the droplets over here. So we are getting there. Finally, uh, we got to make sure that we combine um, with the actual tube surface so that we can clip out all the areas that are not meant to be rounded. Because if we look at, if we ghost our tube now, it's actually penetrating the surface of the tube here. So we don't want that. So we can use this little guy here to make sure that we run this on the intersection right yet once again another vdb combine and this time our operation would be to get the intersection here so you can see that we only get the intersection of the bubbles like this okay so now we're just going to drop down a file cache node here so file cache maybe good idea to save my file now and then uh, call it the bubbles and run the file cache node Okay, so now that's been cached, I'm just going to drop down a file note to bring that in. Um, it's a um, good habit to name your file cache and file note the same name. Just plug it in together for just a visual connection. And then just going to pick up the cache over here, the geo. So this is my cache. And of course, in order to render this, I need to convert this back to polygons. So convert VDB. And I'm just going to change it back to polygons like this. So this uh, runs quite smoothly. So uh, I'm thankful for that. And now I'm going to drop down a, another out note here. This shall be called out bubbles. And then can jump outside to the setup node. So right now we're in the OBJ context. I'm just going to drop down two geo nodes. One for the bubbles and another for the tube. Okay, I'll press Control 1 to set a quick mark for my OBJ context like this. Under the matte context, I'm just going to press Control 2 and just drop down to redshift material builder notes redshift material builder so one is for the bubbles and the other is for the tube and find uh, set this material context to control 2 so when you press 1 and 2 you can switch between them and finally uh, the out context i'm just going to press control 3 and drop down redshift render rob just ensure that under the ipr option we can check these uh, three boxes so that as we ipr um do a kick off a progressive render we can actually see the changes to our scene right and to render the whole frame range and set the output path to the defaults is fine and of course we haven't created our camera so at some point we need to adjust this so let's uh, jump to um but i do have some presets i use in my studio so i'm just going to go here and set it to the preset here so let's click on the redshift render view and just um, well before i press render i have to at least have some objects to render right so let's jump into the empty bubbles geometry node drop down a object merge and we click on setup and pull in the bubbles here and make another object merge in the tube uh, object and just type tube here so this tube is a single surface tube i don't think it has a uh, thickness so we might have to do something about that at some point so let's uh, just render this so we have created a render cam by default so let's just um, position our cam by pressing looking through the render cam and pressing this padlock and select the objects and press spacebar f to frame it so this is our camera and we'll use the usual orbital camera trick by dropping down null and typing dollar ff multiplied by 0.1 on the y-axis so we can get some orbital motion like this. Nothing fancy. And maybe use a longer lens. So maybe 80 millimeters. And just set this to HD. So we have an issue now that um, the ends of this uh, tube does not get off screen. So we might be able to adjust that since our simulation actually doesn't run all the way. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the rendering. So let's uh, kick off the render. And maybe just before, uh, let me pause the render and just drop down a light dome and choose an HDRI. Okay, so on the bubbles, I'm just going to select the material option and change it to water. And for the tube, I'm just going to change it to glass. And so let me assign the materials, this to bubbles and this to glass. Right, and we need to build some sort of environment. So let's drop down a grid and just make another grid and press R to rotate it 90 degrees here. Minus 90, 
press T for translate to move it backwards. Turn off the magnet and uncheck this padlock and move my camera around to start modeling this environment. Maybe size down the grid somewhat like this. Make another grid once again and rotate this this time. 90 degrees here, maybe just move this back to not intersect with our main main subject matter. And perhaps uh, these two grids can get lower so that more light passes through like this. So if we press render now, we can see that uh, everything is a little bit blown. Um, then maybe we can add another Redshift RS material, Blender, and this time it's for the ground or the environment. Let's just call it environment. And I'm just going to assign it to these three grids here, environment. I'm just going to color these three grids so that we know that they are meant to be a bunch together. And for the environment, I'm just going to change it to, to be rough on the surface. So like a 0.5 roughness and give it a bit more samples. And maybe just uh, dial down the environment to be slightly, have some color and slightly darker. Yep, so you can see something like this and maybe rotate our light a little bit. So one thing you might notice is that these things don't feel like they're rendered correctly. Um, that's because the normals of the bubbles are facing outwards, right? And also there's no thickness in our tube here. So let's uh, just jump in there and just go to this tube over here, which we are rendering and just pull it out here. After subdivision, we can drop down a poly extrude here, extrude it by just a small amount, 0.01 and choose output pack. So the poly extrude node, if you look at it uh, from a clipping point of view here, um, this distance actually moves the geometry outwards like this. There is a way to make sure that it doesn't only go outwards, but actually expands uh, both surfaces, which is to use the vellum post process node. So what this node does is you can check this extrude by thickness checkbox, and it will attempt to read the p-scale attribute of the points and give it some thickness, and it pushes it on both ways. Right? However, there is no thickness attribute now, so I'm just going to write my own, just drop down point wrangle, and just type f at p scale equals to 0 0.01. And you can see that the vellum post process node then uh, reads the p scale information and gives it thickness. The good thing about this is it pulls it, pulls it bi directionally, right? So you can just adjust it like this. So right now we can make our own slider here, or we can just use this convenient slider that is, comes with the vellum post process node. So I'm lazy, I'm just going to use this. So 0 0.015. This feels like good enough thickness. And we can observe that um, our VDB uh, geometry, let's get it somewhere here, is cutting through um, these two walls like this. So this actually is ideal. So what we don't want you know, when rendering is when the surface is either inside or touching. So when the surface is inside, it will actually cause uh, some unnatural look of the refraction. Maybe I can discuss more about rendering uh, liquids and refractive surfaces in another video. But uh, in this video, I'll just uh, you verbally explain that like, uh, like when you look at a wine glass and the, the liquid is filling up the wine glass, it actually doesn't look like there's a gap there. The wine volume actually looks like it fills up all the way to the edges of the surface. And that I believe is because there's no pockets of air left between the liquid and the glass, which then makes it behave as if it's a uniform uh, refraction, which is in this case, that's what we want. So whenever you are rendering glasses and water surfaces, you can take note of that, uh, that the geometry within it should pass through the thickness of the wall like this. And the other concern that I have is the normals of this is pointing outwards uh, as evidenced by, if we look at the normals, it's pointing outwards like this. So what we do want is for the normals to point inwards. Right? This is kind of like a strange concept, but when the normals point inwards, it actually mimics the, the look so the point normals are pointing outwards here. Oh, this is really long, so it's difficult to see. Maybe I'll just write down a point wrangle to show you what I mean. So I just type at n times equals 0 0.01 to see the normals shortened. So you can see that the normals are actually pointing outwards. So when the light hits this surface, it will make it look like a solid piece of liquid uh, as if it's filled with water. However, these are air bubbles that we are trying to mimic here. So what we can do is to multiply the normals by minus one. 
so times equals minus 0.01 so it actually flips onto the inside so when a renderer picks this up it will actually render it as if the inside of the surface is is uh, computed normally so the inside is now the vacuum and the outside is um, the water surface i hope that makes sense and i'm not going to scale down my normals like this i'm just going to multiply by minus one so that i flip the normals around and that's it i'm just going to jump out now and jump back to my camera and just save this render to let's just see the difference and just kick off the render again you can see that there are a lot of black spots over here we can overcome them this is just the renderer's uh, default optimization so i can click on the redshift node here under globals and under refraction rays i can increase this to 12 and 16 and you can see that a lot of the black areas are cleared and it's uh, reflect, refracting and reflecting a lot of the environment. So let's just look at the tube without the bubbles. They look like this. Maybe it needs more thickness, I'm not sure. So let me just dial this to 0.3. Jump outside. Well, another trouble with rendering refractive surfaces is that um, by, by default, there's an optimization. So you can see that uh, light is supposed to pass through this glass and cast some shadows here and then also cause some caustics uh, to fill the shadows with uh, some extra caustic lighting. However, uh, caustics are expensive to render nowadays. So most renderers out there, they approximate the effect by making the shadows not pass through at all. Right? So to get around that under this tube option here, under optimizations or rather advanced, we can see over here, you see shadow opacity is zero by default for refractive objects, which is weird. And if we turn it on fully, you can see that it casts a shadow like this, right? Which is also weird because um, technically it shouldn't be so strong. So it's either we render caustics, which can be potentially expensive, or we can dial this to 0.5 to kind of mimic that effect right where we have some shadows and still some light passing through the shadow hope that makes sense and we can do also the same for the bubbles here under optimizations sorry under advanced if we turn on the shadows and let me sh first show the bubbles so the bubbles look like this now if we then jump over to the shader of the bubbles over here we can turn on shadows and you will see over here that it casts so that's pretty interesting um, when it is on the inverted surface, it actually casts the shadows. So what I'm talking about is if I do not invert the normals here and just get to the convert VDB, jump outside and refresh the render, you can see that the water actually doesn't, doesn't cast any shadows here, right? So it appears that, um, I'm lacking one surface also, uh, which is the water surface. So maybe it's always a little bit tricky um, trying to render the air bubbles versus rendering the water surface with the air bubbles inside and also the glass tube and we have many surfaces to consider it can be technically correct but visually it just isn't correct right so this is the delicate balance that we have to walk uh, in production so in this case i could be very technically correct and make a water surface that also minuses the the bubbles to make it look correct but in this case having um, s tried some configuration it feels like we do not have to invert the normals in this case and they look generally quite good so let's uh, just run with that so one last thing is uh, the bubbles are moving at a high speed so we can attempt to get some um, velocity information there uh, right now the velocity information is absent after we did all our conversion to the vdb uh, we can see that there's no more velocity information here and because the nature of VDBs is that the geometry is changing all the time, uh, it's unable to store uh, some level of recognizable geometry that is able to compute some deformation. Hence, it lost, lost its ability to compute the motion blur based on the shape deformation. So what we can do is to compute based on point velocity, which actually is still available uh, over here in our pop simulation here, just that we need to cache our pop simulation. So let's do that. So uh, duplicate the cache nodes and just call this uh, bubble points b points and also call this b points so let's just cache this oh, before i do that i'm just going to drop down a clean node to clean everything except the velocity and i will not remove unused points 
or degenerate primitives if not with nothing left. So what is left is only the velocity attribute and I'm just going to cache this. So save to disk and that's done. And I'm just going to pick up the B points here. So it has the velocity attribute here. Um, in order to visualize that, you can drop press X and you can visualize um, V and we can choose the marker and choose vector and then we can see the point velocities like this. It's coming down like this really fast. And this velocity information can be transferred to the geometry over here, right? So using the attribute transfer, I can transfer the V attribute from my points from this cache here onto the points over here. So if we visualize the velocity attributes of this resulting geometry now, they all have uh, some velocity attributes, right? Which we can use for blurring. So if we jump outside now, and under the bubbles here, under Redshift OBJ tab, we can check mesh deformation blurs from velocity attribute like this. And so if we go to our render settings here and enable motion blur, we should be able to see that um, this uh, liquid is blurring. So this is frame 72. So yeah, so before and after, you can see that there's blurring going on now, which makes for something quite natural uh, for fast moving particles like this. So this is it. Um, combining just a particle seam and a blobby sphere to achieve something that uh, looks kind of liquidy. So let's just, just take some time to beautify this render. Um, first and foremost, I think we should not uh, end this uh, little tube over here. So uh, let's just cheat it by going to, uh, you can, in retrospect, you can probably just adjust this on your own. I'm just going to cheat this output here by making another poly wire. And before this is my, those other nodes, I'm leaving it for simulation. Right, this one, I'm using it for rendering. And just before I, before I polywire this last one, I'm just going to take this last point over here and transform it outwards like this. And maybe resemble once more like this. Right, so this is uh, my pipe fully extended. I do not need this match size, but I do need to steal the match size from the original match size here. So let's just call this red because this is an important match size. I want to steal the X form attribute from, gonna steal it from this match size node, and it moves it up by that amount. Okay, so let's just check the render again. So now the tube has uh, successfully extended, and it's a little bit dark in this area here. So let me just um, maybe choose another background color, something lighter, maybe slightly less saturated. And perhaps I can lower the intensity of my light. 2.8. Okay, so let's uh, refer back to our notes again. So we created a line, the tube, and we ran a particle seam, uh, ran it based on the pop curve force, and then we generated um, our geometry over here, um, our mock uh, single blobby bubble geometry and copied onto the particles. And then we used a little VDB trick to make sure that they are contained within the tube. And then we discussed a little bit about rendering um, liquids in Redshift. Right, so this is the result that uh, we are end up with, and I think I'm just gonna send this to render, and maybe I'll just add some uh, metal tubes over here at the sides. Okay, that's it for the lesson in this video. I hope you enjoyed this little quick tip. I hope it benefits, helps you understand a little bit about how to combine different kinds of uh, simulation techniques together. It doesn't mean that for water, we always have to use the flip solver. Neither does it mean that uh, we cannot use the flip solver for these kind of situations, right? Because sometimes uh, we can, it, it happens often that uh, we devise some cheat method and then we just fall in love with it and we keep trying it. But sometimes just actually doing the simulation might be also a time saver. So it depends on your understanding and the computing resources, the computing resources that you may have uh, at the studio you work at or maybe at home. And uh, that's it for this video and I'll see you in the next one, right? We are on episode eight now. And uh, I think the, the last round, the, the volume simulation one has uh, gotten quite a bit of feedback. So thanks for all that. Uh, the video ran long, <laughs> uh, but I think I, I explained some important concepts there. And I do know I want to end this series uh, with the pattern making um, that uh, a few of you have pointed out that uh, that's what you would like to me to end off with also. 
Um, but yeah, I'm at lost for what to do in episode nine. Oh, actually, I mentioned in the previous episode that I will do some hair simulation, right? So I think episode nine will be a hair simulation, and then we'll finish off um, with uh, clothing pattern making. Do I need to point you to my Instagram? I think I should anyway. If this is the only video that's gonna you're gonna watch, so let me just jump to Google Chrome. So my Instagram handle is uh, Ronald underscore Fong. Yeah, so this is my Instagram page and um, in the last episode I was explaining how to achieve uh, this wind tunnel effect uh, that you can uh, go and watch the tutorial in the previous lesson and then this time just covering some pipes and liquids and next week um, we are going to do some hair simulation and the week after we'll finish with the pattern making stuff over here. Right? Uh, other than some tutorials, I also share uh, the stuff that we do at the studio, um, Masonry Studios. Uh, we are a little company that does uh, a bunch of uh, CGI commercials for, for a bunch of electronic products and beauty products. And most recently, we are on this adventure to create our little short film. And this is some of the character stuff that we have been working on. Uh, so if you're like into this kind of things too, <laughs> please uh, consider following us and uh, subscribe to uh, the things that we're doing. Subscribe doesn't work for Instagram. So what is it? Yeah, follow masonry studios and also follow uh, uh ronald underscore fong that's me and yeah i think i've ran off things to say so um see you the in episode nine right uh it's uh, once again it's ronald speaking and uh take care and bye bye